but I love what I do. You know, I've, uh, if I dive into hand rolling pizzas, I love it. If I dive into building an outdoor kitchen, I love it. I, I think it's creation. I think it has to do with creating and evolving and making things better. An artist is, is my drive is being a, a passionate artist. Yeah. Well, we just got here to a site in uh, Stony Creek where we're going to add some, uh, add a, an extra light and uh, take a look at what's going on with his outdoor kitchen and with his barbecue won't ignite so easily and consistently. Cool. Well, let's take a look. Well, it's interesting too that the, it wasn't in the scope of work to build a new gate but I think near the end of the project he did inquire to say what about doing a, a new gate might put that on the agenda think the drive to keep going to when there's when something knocks you down just to get up and go again and keep going comes from I think it goes back to that moment in time when I was getting my diploma on the stage and everybody laughed and said ah oh, why do you want to be a landscaper it's like I'll show you I can be successful I'll show myself I can be good at this I, I think it's just a self-drive Maybe, maybe there was that moment when you kind of get laughed at on a public stage that, uh, well, what's the big joke, you know, uh, I can do something that's great. And I think I'm driven by wanting to make positive change. And I think it's that always that moment, little voice in the back of my head that says, you're bigger than this. And why don't you go ahead and do it? You know, see that I can do it. Yeah. And I, I take on something and I, I do my best. I give it my all. Before I dismantle that, and sometimes get your hands dirty, I'm I'm using these silicone. That's the first time I've seen those. Yeah, they're they're filled with silicone. So what they do is they prevent water from getting in at your connections. Now this one doesn't look like that. That passion and drive for this in particular. Where did the idea for landscaping come from? I guess I was kind of pushed in that direction by my dad. I was thinking about 14, at the age of 14, and I was getting $5 a week for an allowance. So, you know, between, we didn't, have a, we didn't have hand washing dishes. I mean, we had to hand wash dishes. We didn't have a washing machine, dishwasher, you know, take out the garbage, wanted a dog. Well, I got to clean up the dog poop and cut the grass. And so I'm turning 14, going into grade nine, and my dad says to me, he goes, okay, you're old enough not to have an allowance by me anymore. And I looked at him and I'm like, what? I, I do all this work. He goes, well, you're growing up now. You know, these are the contributions to the household you should be making. You should go and get yourself a job. Now, back then, it wasn't really easy for a 14 year old to get a job. So I just said, well, you know, what, what could I do? And he goes, well, I know uh, my tennis friend. So my dad had a tennis friend whose son would go and cut grass and earn some money within the neighborhood. And I said, well, that's a great idea. Can I borrow your lawnmower? He goes, no, get your own. <laughs> so we lived in Pleasant Valley in Dundas. And what was interesting coming around to April was usually in the spring, there was this big spring dump. Like everybody would bring everything out from bicycles to lawnmowers to literally the kitchen sink could be dropped off at the end of a driveway. And so there was that timing, which was perfect, that when the spring cleanup happened in Pleasant Valley, Pleasant Valley was a very affluent area of Dundas, that I would walk around and I found 
parts to put together a, a 10 speed bicycle. I also found the parts uh, through a couple of, I think it was Frankenstein from three different lawnmowers. So I found some lawnmowers, one that had a really good shell intact, but the motor and the wheels were not good. One that had a really good motor intact, but had a crack shell. And the other one that had the handles and the wheels that were really in good shape and had no motor at all. So I took those all home and I jimmied them all together and Frankenstein this new lawnmower and it worked pretty much on the second or third pull I got it going. And same thing with a bicycle. So I couldn't afford to buy my own bike. My dad wasn't buying me one. So I put together a 10, it was a 10 speed bicycle then, not 12 speed. And a piece of nylon cord and I traveled around Dundas on this bicycle with a lawnmower tied behind me and I went and I started cutting grass. And I did that for about two years and I made so much money, I had banked it all, that when it came time to get into my car, now my dad was pretty cool, he did hand me down his Volkswagen Rabbit, which I ripped out the back seats and I immediately turned into a, kind of like a mini station wagon. But El Camino I, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, pretty much. But I was also able to invest in my own new lawnmower and a new gas trimmer and a used backpack blower I bought from Windmill Power Equipment. And I remember when Windmill Power Equipment first opened up where um, Dundas Lock and Key was today. I think they're, they're there now off of King Street. It was a little hole in the wall uh, garage attached to this commercial residential area. Vince, who owned the company. And um, I met him and I was buying my, my uh, equipment. I still, today, um, and with Windmill Power Equipment when we rent for all our big landscape jobs, but started off with that equipment then I got into my first used pickup truck and I got the calls you know at the age of 16 17 for doing um, small little landscape jobs like little gardening jobs uh, replacing an old walkway and putting in new patio stones which eventually I graduated to doing interlocking work and then the jobs just slowly got bigger and bigger got to a point where my skills as a an artisan or an artist. I was really good with freehand drawing, so I decided, okay, I'm gonna explore the landscape design industry and hone my skills as a, an artist, but designing outdoor landscapes. And the evolutionary process just kinda all fell into place. There was really no force by it. You know, my dad kinda guided me to say, go figure out how to make your own dollar, yeah. to being crafty that way. And, and then the evolutionary period of of customers referring me to one of their friends or their aunt or their grandmother that needed my help or my services and the Dundas community was very supportive of you know hiring a, a young guy from Dundas and and that's how my business grew. You went to Japan and Australia how that also plays currently in your designs? Well actually um, my aunt say godmother very influential in my life you know, growing up as a child and a teenager, she was that type of aunt that would, you know, for presents, w wouldn't be toys. It always had to be expanding my mind. So it was National Geographic. Every year I would get National Geographic from her and I would always look forward to getting that in the mail. And there's a lot of things about seeing the world that I was inspired from just reading National Geographic. But she herself, made her roots in Tokyo, Japan. She went there after university in, um, here in Canada. She decided that she wanted to be a journalist and uh, photographer, so she went to go visit Japan, met a Japanese fella, fell in love, got married, and she was so intelligent with her writing and her language. She was learning Japanese, she spoke several languages. She was new Lithuanian, German, Japanese. It made her also great for going to political um, venues and become an interpreter. And uh, she also wrote for Reuters, which was, I guess, one of the backbone uh, publishing companies for Maclean's magazine. She was very worldly and loved you know, travel as well. She was an avid scuba diver and, and journalist, and she knew that I would absolutely love Japan. She, she called me up and she says, you know, you're 19, you should, uh, before you commit to, you know, 
rooting yourself somewhere or with someone, why don't you come to Japan and stay with me for a while? And also while you're on your way here, you should get a Circle Pacific ticket, which she ended up buying for me as a gift so that I would go to Australia and see the Great Barrier Reef and go scuba diving. So it was something that she wanted me to experience and she was very passionate about. She uh, insisted that I, I get the Circle Pacific ticket so I would be gone at least from home for three months and go travel the world. So cool. my first venture was actually Australia, which I stayed about a month there. Maybe it was a month and a half. And I caught up with some friends, one of them that was actually a high school rival out of Ancaster High. I went to Highland High and we were uh, rivals on the gymnastics team. And anyway, he, he was in Australia. He um, established himself out there as a football coach. So I got to go hang out with him and uh, traveled up and down the highway. So I went all the way north to the Cairns in, in uh, Australia and then back to Sydney. And then I went to Japan and stayed with my aunt for a month and a half. And I, but I didn't actually stay in one spot when I got there and it was really crafty of my aunt. I arrived exactly the day she wanted me to, but when I got to the airport, Tokyo, she was acting all frazzled. She's like, oh, you're here too soon. I'm, I'm sorry, this is not good. And I looked at her and I'm like, well, you told me to arrive on this day and you're here picking me up. And she goes, I know, I know what we have to do though is I got to send you down to Nagasaki on this sleep car train. And then you got to at least give me a week. I'm not ready for you. You got to give me a week and you got to make your way back up to Tokyo. And you know, I'm going to give you some money and this little sketch pad book so you can make notes and a translator manual and you need to go. So I literally got to spend one night with my aunt in Tokyo and then the next night I was on the sleep car train. So literally you travel all the way from Tokyo down to Nagasaki, you sleep on this, this train and I basically went from hostel to hostel, garden to garden. I was so inspired to see all the gardens in Japan. So from Nagasaki up to Kyoto, back up to Tokyo, and I stopped at all these other little towns or districts. And I saw sword making artisans and pottery artisans, beautiful gardens, amazing gardens. And it really inspired me about Japanese style gardening. And that brought me back into Canada, a bit influential in the Japanese garden techniques. And you'll see a little bit in some of my work, if you ever go on my online portfolio, you'll see that I have a real connection with nature and there are some examples of Asian influence. But um, that's really why uh, I had traveled because of my aunt and uh, gained some influential styles in the Japanese garden technique. So, and wh so where did Niagara College fall in with landscape design? Well, originally I thought, okay, I might own my own lawn maintenance landscape company at first. So when I decided that I should get some education behind me in the horticultural industry, because one thing, whether you want to be a landscaper or whether you want to be a designer, horticulture, plants, knowing your plants is the backbone of the industry. So Niagara College was renowned for its horticultural diploma. I decided to step back from my self kind of employed work and I went to Niagara College and it was a three-year program condensed down to two years for the first time and I learned everything about horticulture I learned also about you know being on the tools even a border culture like tree climbing and landscape design so as I felt like my future was going to be in lawn maintenance and construction off the hop when I graduated from Niagara College, my first year of employment working for a garden center, which I was gonna be doing some landscaping for, as well as being in the nursery selling plants, I was doing construction and I injured myself. I injured my back. And I was, I, I felt like I was crippled. I was like eight months, I could literally not even tie my shoes, let alone get dressed. So that had put me in a state of, okay, well, I don't think I can be on the tools anymore, do the physical work. So I took a night school course to supplement landscape design, felt like, okay, my, my brain and my hands can handle, you know, doing design, but my back couldn't. So again, kind of the universe pushed me in the direction of doing design work. So I self-taught how to use a computer uh, using AutoCAD. I learned 
hand-drawn design. I hybrid that, uh, started doing digital AutoCAD drawings for other landscapers that I got to know through the industry. I would say it was a slow build of a little landscape empire, landscape design empire of designing for about 15 contractors in the Ancaster, Waterdown and Dundas area doing all their landscape designs as a ghost designer. You know, I would put their names on their drawings. It would be signed by, designed by DM, David Chulis, but I never had a logo until somebody called me up and said, hey, are you natural landscaping? And I said, no, I'm Dave Chulis. I do natural theme designs. And they said, oh, well, my uh, sister got a design from some landscaper and they just said that it was a natural landscape. And I said, well, it's a lot of native planting because Dundas and Ancaster are very close to the uh, Conservation and Niagara Escarpment Commission, so I kind of lean towards the native natural landscaping. But then I had this light bulb in my head go off and I went, oh, natural landscape, natural landscaping. So came up with natural landscape design, registered the company back in, I guess that would have been 1990. That's where I am today, is uh, that many years later, called Natural Landscape Group. I got better physically and, you know, for, for health reasons of the back and just physiotherapy and just taking care of myself and building my strength back up that I got back into construction. Now we do full landscape design and build. Uh, residential is our focus, building outdoor landscapes. So. I remember the best story ever of a customer in it. We're still very good friends today. It was 12 years ago that we did their landscaping for them. He was a real analytical guy. He was in the IT business, but he analyzed everything down to, you know, his return on investment when, when he spent his money. He's like, the gentleman wanted um, a landscape that uh, was just a pool restoration and, and a patio, but his wife wanted an outdoor pavilion and kind of like an outdoor living room. And he's like, we're never gonna use, in fact, they had a little argument in front of me, it made it a little uncomfortable at first. But then I said to him, I said, well, I'll bet you that you'll be using this backyard landscape extended from, let's say, early spring into December. And he's like, absolutely no way. He goes, I'll take that bet. It was a gentleman's bet, bet, bet 100 bucks. He followed through with having us execute the whole project. And we had a fire attainment center out under the pavilion and he had his bar with his built-in kitchen, had his patio and we did the pool restoration. And I get a phone call just before New Year's. It was after Christmas, but it was before New Year's. And I get a call from him. His name was Michael and Michael called me. He's like, hi Dave. And I'm like, hi Michael, how are you? And he's like, well, calling you for two reasons one I don't do this often it was one to tell you that you were right and you win and I said oh part of me he's like you you win the bet you know just to let you know that Gail has been out there almost every night and close to Christmas when it was like minus five out they're out there till two o'clock in the morning you know having their white wine and she's with her girlfriends and they're out there conversations going late into the night so I, I get it, they, we, we've got good use out of this landscape, but I'm also calling you to give you some heck. And I'm like, oh really? And he goes, well, you made it so good that I can't get Gail inside the house and at two o'clock in the morning with her yelling and giggling and playing music, I got a fine. The cop showed up, I got a fine. Now I had to pay that fine. So I think like we should call it square here on the bet. I, I said, you're absolutely right, Michael, keep the money but thanks for letting me know. Can I tell this story in the future? He goes, absolutely. He goes, Davey did a fantastic job. He goes, I would have never believed that we could be out in the middle of December using this backyard that, you know, the money that was well invested, I have to admit it was well invested. You did a fantastic job. And he goes, you proved me wrong. And he goes, it's such a great opportunity. He goes, I can see us opening up in April, my outdoor bar and barbecue, because he was a real griller barbecue kind of guy and he loved having his cocktails and his martinis and his wife just loved sitting out by the fire team and center under the pavilion with her girlfriends late at night so yeah it was a very win-win situation that's and, awesome um, yeah great great story and it, it really inspired me to kind of stay on this whole trend of creating outdoor lifestyle living rather than landscaping I really don't consider myself a, a landscaper I'm 
I'm very passionate about what I do, but I consider myself more of a an inspirationalist or an outdoor lifestyle inspirationalist to help other Canadians really know what it's like to live their backyards outdoors. Yeah. So had to be some struggles starting out. Um, <laughs> okay, I got a great I got a great one for or, you. Or even along the way or currently or Well, yeah, currently. So this was <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm not destined to be retired. So I, I feel like I've struggled with being a workaholic all my life. So really interesting story. I don't know if maybe maybe this is what perpetuated it. It was graduating year. Grade in high school in uh, well grade twelve. I did a victory lap, so call it grade thirteen, because I wanted to get my OACs so I, if I went to college I was getting exempt from some of the other other studies. Uh, it was the year I made honor roll. I was one of those kids that if there was ADHD label back in the 70s, I would have been labeled that. But it was like all my report cards was Dave is a jokester or disturbs others in class. Dave needs to focus more on his schooling. So I was always that kid getting B minuses and C pluses. Yeah, that's not a familiar report card at all. Yeah, but then graduating year, Highland High School, uh, I made the honor roll. Really applied myself to my studies. And as I went up, waiting for my diploma, you know, the, the announcer at the time handing out the diplomas would say what each student was aspiring to be. So I was, you know, letter M for Machulis, so I was kind of middle of the row. So at the beginning, the other academics are, you know, saying that they want to be a teacher or a police officer or a dentist or a doctor. And, comes to, to say my name and I said I think I want to own my own landscaping or gardening business in Dundas and everybody laughed it was really strange like I, I kind of thought what's so funny and as I, I go to shake the hand of the principal ready to hand me the diploma I stopped and I turned and I looked at the entire crowd and I thought why are you all laughing at me like you know, I'll, I guess maybe in the back of my head, it was like, I'll show you I want to be successful one day. And that uh, that started me building this business and I never stopped working. I, I think I was just like the guy that worked six, seven days a week. I tried on a rarity not to work a, a Sunday, not so much for religious reasons, just to give my body a day of rest, but I was constantly striving to be successful. I guess it was to show my inner self or ego self that I could be just as important as a doctor or you know a school teacher or a dentist and change and help people's lifestyles yep. to be better improved working and working and then I get to this point in my career where it's like okay maybe I should consider retirement I've, I've worked on my hands and knees laying interlocking stone and doing all this work that I'm doing all my life and I think maybe I need to plan my retirement so about eight years ago I meet some business partners that I feel like would be good protégés to take over the company and they actually insisted that they will take over and you know when do I want to retire I said oh I'd love to retire at 55 and this is my year I turned 55 and all those young business partners have now moved on to other things I guess they found the customer service business a little too difficult for them COVID was a real struggle you know, even though there were people that wanted to put improvements in their backyard lifestyle because they felt like if you're if you're stuck at home, why not invest? So the first year was great, but then interest rates go up and nobody wants to take loans out. So we've hit a real milestone struggle right now for this company. I'm pretty much going to be solo. Don't have younger protégés taking over my business. And so I'm feeling like, yeah, the universe is really challenging me right now to persevere and stay with it so I am downsizing we had three crews at once and now we're gonna have one I call it my one super crew yeah yeah it's it, it, you know you, you feel like you're at that point where you're hoping for retirement and you just realize you can't you know I got responsibilities with customers and suppliers and of course the government wants their cut and during COVID we had some struggles so you know money's got to be uh, paid off there so I, I feel like my journey's not done. Right. Smith and Smith. Oh, yeah. That was the, the comedy couple. That was when I, actually one of my big first clients. I, I uh, was referred by another landscaper who done some maintenance and service for him. And he introduced me to 
Steve and Mareg Smith. And, and, and uh, so those that don't know, like I, I grew up and I know who Smith and Smith is when yeah. you sell it, but red green red green yeah <laughs> if they don't find you handsome they'll find you handy exactly yes <laughs> yeah yeah actually maybe that's the plaid my toque i wear is a little bit uh i was going to mention that earlier you kind of looked like uh, red green <laughs> yeah thanks i'll take it as a compliment oh it totally is um but yeah that was one of my uh i guess you could say customers that uh, were celebrities in the duran kirkland area actually influential too i got a lot of referrals in that area and i find myself you know 35 years later uh hand rolling pizzas at duran coffee or steel town cider co or at the duran park for movie nights sometimes i struggle with it and i've met other people the same thing they're, they're doing their own business and it really just feels like it's going nowhere it feels like you're doing the right things and nothing's happening with the business. It's not growing, there's no customers calling. Networking, camaraderie and networking. So when you get together with groups of other entrepreneurs, in fact, there's an interesting group that I just met through, and this is through my labor of love, hand rolling pizzas. I'm working at a microbrewery trying to sell my pizzas, but I see this convention or this little group, believe it or not, they call themselves the Fuck It Up Entrepreneur Event. They, they actually, want to hear what entrepreneurs have done that they've messed up and they excuse my French use the terminology fucked up in being an entrepreneur and they share and this energy about sharing the mistakes that people have made you know sharing the mess ups that they've made but also said well what has worked for you to have your business grow so I believe entrepreneurship networking networking events and just being sociable with other successful people. Recently, I, I've joined the Rotary Club in Dundas, the Sunrise Rotary Club, and talking with other members of Rotary in just the short period that I've been there has also given me certain insight, talking to some people that are 20 years older than me, willing to share some of the things that they've done either in business or trying to get their own businesses off the ground, but then decided to go back and work for somebody and retire. But it's great energy when you commune with others. What advice would you give anyone starting their own business? Because you've started a number of businesses. Make lots of mistakes, but don't give up. You know, uh, it's always good to experiment. It's always good to try and explore areas that nobody else is doing. Be adventurous, think out of the box, and. You know, sure, if you mess up, just stand behind your work and say, I'm going to fix it or I know better what not to do. What but ask questions. And any entrepreneur that wants to start their own business, seek those that you would like to eventually get to and ask them. Just ask them, are you willing to share with me, you know, the business that you're in, what not to do? Because that's what I did one time. I met a mentor who was 15 years older than me. We met actually teaching at Mohawk College. I, I started teaching night school, plant identification. I was a young professor. I was only about 26 years old. And Mohawk College wanted to start this horticultural program and they asked me to do it. And I met another professor who's 15 years older, but he was also a landscape design builder. And we would just like catch up for a beer every once in a while and he would share with me his mistakes, things that he's done, or I would say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, and he would say, that's a fantastic idea, it was something I was gonna try and never did, or he did try it, learned something about it, said avoid this, and so, you know, mentorship, it's always good to find yourself a mentor and ask questions. Every time 
the bush comes to shot I'm climbing over you to reach the top Cause I want everything or nothing at all Yeah, I want everything or nothing at all Cause I want everything or nothing, nothing, nothing Nothing at all Don't care what you think or what you believe Cause I'm gonna turn the world upside down If you wanna shine, just up in the ring Yeah, I'ma shake your bones like thunder Even when my feet get tired I will keep on moving higher I'm the story you don't speak of I'm the one they call the underdog Cause every time the push comes to shove I'm climbing over you to reach the top Cause I want everything and nothing at all Yeah, I want everything and nothing at all Cause I want everything and nothing, nothing, nothing Uh, so the red door, yeah. we'll start at the beginning and that's actually how I met you myself was through the red door and it's starting up seeing the article in the newspaper, but tell me where the idea came and how the red door all came to be. Yeah, that's, it's actually an interesting story because, um, my son who was working at the time for the previous owner, it was a, a Kachina referred to as uh, Fazari's Kachina, Lou Fazari. My son was working for him. And my son phones me just out of the blue in the middle of my working day and says, Dad, I figured out what I want to do. I said, what is that? And he goes, I want to roll pizza. And I went, pardon? He goes, oh, I'm really passionate about pizza and, and the making of it and hand rolling it. And this light bulb went off in my head. Is like the first time that my teenage, well, at that time, turning 19, said the word passion in his vocabulary and I thought okay that's really hit home with me because myself I use that terminology when something really resonates with me and just telling you this right now it is because I'm getting goosebumps on my arms and that's just sort of how how the vibe tells me that that's what was supposed to happen or how it's come to be so Tyler convinces me to uh, buy the Kachina uh, at the time Lou was having some changes in his life so I ended up buying the now called Red Door Kachina. And the reason being is as I was thinking of the new name that I wanted to call this place, while I was always ordering food at that location, I would always tell my employees, okay, go down this laneway and you'll see these big red doors. That's the place that we're gonna go pick up our lunch. So this again, epiphany hits me that, uh, why don't I just call it the Red Door Kachina? Because descriptively, everybody knows to go find this little hole in the wall at the back of a laneway that comes off of Park Street, hence the name, the Red Door Kachina. Yeah, unfortunately it is a little hard to find. So yeah, the, yeah. the, the Red Door helps. What I noticed was there was an article in the newspaper featuring your son, 19, starting yeah. his own pizzeria. And I thought, yeah. this is really awesome. This young kid is starting his own business. Mm -hmm. I had no idea who you were, he was, and the whole story. And I thought it was just fantastic. So I reached out, I think to him, yeah. to see if, because I was doing photography at the time, can I come photograph you and help share your story? Mm -hmm. And then you got in touch with me. Yeah. What did you think of this crazy photographer reaching out of nowhere that wanted to <laughs> well, do actually, this? Actually, I was, I was really impressed. I was actually glad to see that my son was getting some help in our community. It really resonated with me again that you were reaching out and being a community guy, I was 100% on board with seeing Tyler in the spotlight, which I thought was great boost for the business. At that point, I was just behind the scenes. I, I really knew nothing about pizza making. I really knew nothing about the restaurant business. Call me a little bit of a serial entrepreneur. It was kind of a hobby of helping my son learn the ropes of entrepreneurship. So I welcomed your, um, your gift in, in helping Tyler uh, become noticed. And it really did help the business. I mean, at the time, we were really still low-key quiet. Nobody knew about us. Uh, we did connect there at the brewery local to Dundas, in which you came out to to shoot Tyler and see his uh his talents with just hand rolling the pizza and you know you were catching these amazing photos of him tossing dough up in the air and 
that really kickstarted things for us. It really helped boost within the community. I got involved on the social media aspect of it. So when I asked permission from you to, can we use some of these photos to boost them up in the, the Red Door Instagram, you know, we just slowly watch the interest in the numbers go up and a slow following started happening. A neat thing about Dundas community is when there's a story within Dundas happening about somebody in Dundas, it's amazing the community that does step forward to assist. And they were all like, yeah, let's see what this pizzeria is about. Let's see what this 19 year old kid is doing. And a lot of people were showing up because of Tyler. And I think it was being at Sean and Ed's brewery because they didn't have any food themselves at the time when they opened. So you were there a lot mm -hmm. outdoors with the big stone oven. Yep. And I think being on basically on the sidewalk or on the side of the road yeah. really helped with the exposure. You had your red door sign out there and, yeah. and I lived up the street. So I was always walking by taking photos, especially if I knew you were there or something was going on like yeah. Cactus Fest and Busker Fest and and stuff. I think being outside cooking was drew a lot exposure. of people for exposure as well. So. Yeah, it was. It was great opportunity, great exposure. Uh, I really did appreciate the brewery helping us get that exposure. What was interesting is being out on the sidewalk, especially on that Hat Street, what was interesting is the amount of travel tourism that was coming into Dundas looking for the waterfalls. Because we were out on the sidewalk, people would basically stop their car and they would holler at Tyler or myself, because at that time I was Tyler's helper, and they would say, hey, where do we find the waterfalls of Dundas? I would give them directions. And then they said, so is this a place that we can come and have a beer and a pizza? And I'm like, absolutely. After you're done with the, the waterfalls, come on back this way and you know, park in the public parking lot. And a lot of these people would. So word got out you know, that uh, there was a neat spot in Dundas to find the Red Door uh, working in conjunction with or collaboration with the brewery. That sort of kick-started our existence. I read somewhere you didn't tell your wife about this when you bought it and you kind of bought it <laughs> unbeknownst to her. So. Not, not, not initially because she, interesting thing about Lori is that she's always been very supportive of my crazy ADHD decision-making times which was maybe a little too spontaneous so I did phone her and say, hey, I bought an Italian restaurant. And she thought I was joking. She's like, you did what? And I said, well, you know, there was an opportunity. I took it and we're now going to help Tyler run a little restaurant. And at first she was kind of resilient, uh, resistant. But um, when she walked into the place, she took one look at it. And then she said to me, she goes, OK, I'll go get my my scrubs on and, and she was the first one in that place, literally with like her cut off sweatpants and her sweatshirt and her rubber gloves. And she was cleaning that place from head to toe with me. And we got that place looking ship shape. And um, yeah, uh, as she took to it about a week later, she started boasting to her friends and family, oh, Dave bought an Italian restaurant. We now own a restaurant. Yeah, I think my first few times in to take photos inside the restaurant, I think she was, was she working there helping out at all? Yeah. Uh, well, Lori was more or less being the cleaner behind the scenes. Uh, Lou's ex-wife, who was still friends with Lou and friends with me and Tyler, uh, Jen, she was basically saying, look at, you know, you, if you're looking for some experience in the restaurant business, uh, her mother and her sister and herself could still be employees and help work there. Some help from that side of the family that until they had decided to exit and find employment elsewhere, they stayed on for a small stint and then there was an evolutionary process of new employees that came in to work with Tyler. So Tyler started and you got more involved. Uh, tell me a little bit more about you getting more involved with the Red Door. Well, you know, at a time where this is his first endeavor as an entrepreneur, he started realizing some of the stresses that come with, you know, time management, employees, ordering the food, things that uh, the previous owner had, you know, tried to show him, but it was very stressful for him. So uh, he came to me and said, Dad, I'm, I'm really having difficulty with this on my own. Can you come in and help me now? I'm already running a landscape construction company. 
I do know how to deal with, you know, helping them with employees or setting schedules. So I started getting involved in it. And at one time, and this was really difficult for Tyler, he, um, he said, Dad, I don't know if I can do this. He goes, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm overstressed. I'm staying up at night. Um, I'm thinking too much about, you know, what can go wrong when things aren't going right. Uh, I, can we sell it? And at that point, I thought to myself, yeah, you know what? This is, this is a realization uh, for him, realizing that some people aren't good with the stresses of entrepreneurship. But I said to him, look it, no worries. I'm beginning to like this gig, I guess I called it. And I said, uh, what do you want to do? And he goes, can I come back and work in your construction company? And whether you sell this or I said, look it, how about instead of paying me back the money that I loaned you for the business, I'll take it, I'll work with it. And if you want to come back to construction, you can do that. So that's what ended up happening. I ended up getting a bit more involved in catering bookings and, you know, learning a little bit behind the scenes. I actually thought if I really want this restaurant to go off well, um, why don't I hire a pizziolo, uh, like a Red Seal certified pizza chef to come in and teach the team on how to do this. So that's what I did. I actually met a guy at a food show in Toronto. Uh, Tommaso was his name and he was from Italy. He was working for a flower company at the time. One of the high quality flower companies that flower that we use. He came in, I paid the fee for him to teach this, the team for three days on proper dough fermentation. I learned a little bit about that myself. It really helped kind of kickstart my involvement in being part of Red Door. So tell me a little about Tyler wanted to step away for a bit and he joined the construction side of things with natural landscape design. He did come back again, did he not? Yeah, you know, as he saw the, the red door kind of now taking off, now this is pre-COVID, he was interested with some of the stories I was talking about, you know, the winds that were happening with our exposure with catering, the busyness that was happening, a couple employees that were, you know, coming and going throughout the Kachina. And there was one time that there was a big wedding catering that we were doing. I thought, I think we really need some help on this one weekend. And it was a weekend that Tyler wasn't working in construction. So I said, hey, would you come back and do some hand rolled pizzas with me? So he did. And he realized how the business had grown. He realized how much he actually missed hand rolling the pizzas because he had his hands in the dirt and, you know, digging trees and doing stonework was a little bit backbreaking. And he came to me and said, Dad, I, I really got reconnected here just, you know, helping you that weekend. Maybe I could come back for uh, the Red Door. And I said, whatever you like, like if you want to give the crew back at the other company noticed that you want to exit and come back to the red door by all means. And that did happen. So he did come back for a while again, but, but yeah, um, I was uh, uh, but so you have stepped in more permanently yeah. and he has stepped away almost once again, almost yeah. entirely once again, but he's yeah. still young. Yeah. Tell me about how that evolved from he came back and you were starting to pique your interest in the business, but, now you're almost fully in yeah and he's back Tyler's out. basically out. so yeah that's a great uh, another great story when he he came back in started to learn what it was like to work with his dad because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now i started being a bit more involved and i think what was happening was he realized okay if i'm gonna work i don't want to work with my dad i already did with construction uh but with the pizza business there was maybe um a little bit of friction nothing too serious but he started to realize that he wanted to cut his own path. Instead of actually coming back to construction, what he did is he found another career path. He decided to stay within the red door and tell other pizza chefs of his capability to come in and help me out. So he did that. He, he stuck around probably for almost another four or five months once we were able to find another pizza chef that came in and that was Giovanni, who was also a pizziolo from Syracuse, Italy. Uh, came on board and another pizza chef uh, from Hamilton. Uh, he felt now his exit was good. And he's like, I'm all good with this. If you ever need me on the odd wedding catering on a weekend, he would circle back in to help. 
But other than that, um, he has now moved on to bigger and better things for himself, which I'm really happy for him. Right. And so now it's yourself and yep. you have two. So I, I had two pizza chefs. Uh, the other one from Italy, Gio, uh, as you know, as Giovanni. He um, also went in a different direction uh, as he wants to kind of work on his own restaurant in Hamilton with another chef that he had met. Obviously, my blessing for that. Uh, I never want to see anybody not grow past the means of the red door. They want to grow an entrepreneur of their own business. That was uh, a great decision for him. So the other pizza chef stayed on. Uh, and I step in on weekends because I really have a love for connecting with people uh, and networking with people within the craft brewery industry. So, you know, a place like where we are today at Grain and Grit, uh, amazing culture, amazing people, great craft beer, and it just seems to be the perfect pairing. You know, our, our gourmet pizza and, and the craft brew that comes out of this place just seems to have that marriage match made in heaven for pizza and brew. So it's, it started here actually with uh, my connection with Grain and Grit to work the brewery culture. And eventually I got called by other breweries that know Grain and Grit's uh, beverage uh, selection very well, their beer, beer selection. So places like Fairweather had come to us and Steeltown Cider, West Avenue Cider. They said, hey, would you bring your pop-up oven over to our place as well? And I found an amazing network and build relationships with these breweries and their staffing. Everybody that seems to be in the craft beer industry or craft brew industry just seems to have a really good vibe that connects with me. And I find myself to be at the forefront of the pizza pop-ups on weekends because I'm still actively with construction during the weekday. But uh, this is one of the places that I love being at. Yeah, it's a great little spot. But I wanted to ask you about how the restaurant evolved because you were kind of takeout sort of dine-in mm -hmm. and now you've evolved into essentially portable pizza oven or on location at other restaurants. Yeah, well, I guess that would be because one of my biggest challenges and I would say big oversight was not knowing enough about the restaurant business that Everything is about location, location, location. So the location of the Red Door as a production kitchen is good, but not for retail. It's at the back of a building. We had two ways of access, mutually from the Collins parking lot and the back laneway. So we had a great flow for people that historically traveled through the laneway and the Collins parking lot quite fluidly to get to us. But then there was a recent uh, investor developer that had bought the dry cleaning business next to the Collins that allowed the free flow of traffic for our customers. And he felt it necessary just for liability or legality issues because he's tearing down the building to put up a big wire fence. And that just basically hurt us. It knocked down. 80% of our business. As I thought I could achieve the ability to have dine-in, once that fence went up and realizing what the future plans are, I know it's not going to be the access point anymore. So it's a great production kitchen, but it made me realize instead of stopping the business, I evolve. I am very tenacious. I don't give up easy. I saw an opportunity to go mobile. We maintain the production kitchen for our dough fermentation and prep for our B2B, which really all the breweries and other cider places that buy some of our pre-made pizzas for their large events and or where we're just using it as a production kitchen to ferment our dough so we can go mobile pop-up. And we're surviving. Um, it's slowly building back up again, the numbers, the revenue, but it has been challenging. Uh, there was one time I did think that maybe the universe is trying to tell me, you know, change the plans, but I kind of pushed back and I said to the universe, I'm not ready to give up. So hence I've gone mobile. It might be too early for this question, but do you think the fence going up and forcing you to go mobile is actually a good thing in the long run? Um, I have to always turn lemons into lemonade and that's what helps me persevere. So it could have been one of those, you know, blessings in disguise. Yeah, it did hurt us to a point where financially, yeah, I had to resort to some of the government loans that were out there, but of course, there isn't always a gift of, from the government. So yeah, that's all money that has to be paid back. So it will be a, a challenge to grow. 
Would I have chosen differently that the fence didn't go up? Of course, because it was a bit of a shock in, in the business revenue to see that happen. But um, would it, uh, I don't know. Uh, was there any other major challenges? It's learning the restaurant business or the social media side of it. I feel like marketing and getting the word out there and the brand out there has been adventurous. You know, I, I uh, collaborate with the other breweries and their marketing, so we do co-collaboration. But it's, it's learning how to operate a, a food business, which has been a challenge because for 35 years I've been a hands-on contractor building outdoor landscapes, outdoor patios and outdoor kitchens. Uh, but now I'm working in one of the kitchens. And so just the learning curve of that and just dealing with the, the flow of traffic. So right now I've got to be the traffic that goes out there and right. brings in the business. So Now I think having a symbiotic relationship with breweries is perfect because I'm a beer kind of guy, Yeah, but I want food with my beer. So if mm -hmm. food is lacking, I'm way less likely to come in and order a pint of beer if there's no yeah. food. So I think it's great that you're here on the weekend to offer that option. Yeah. What is next for Dave and the Red Door? I look at it more as my retirement package, not to say that I'm selling the Red Door. It's more that that's probably where I'm leaning to work. I don't feel I'll ever retire and then never do anything. Retiring from construction is in the future. It could be a 24 month or 36 month plan. And then to kind of keep busy and do something that I love doing, which is now I'm starting to learn my son's technique on the hand rolling of the pizza. I'm really enjoying that. In fact, I would call it more of an escape for me. So after a week worth of being out in the construction industry, I actually wake up on a Saturday morning, happy to think that I'm gonna be meeting some really cool, interesting people at the brewery that I'll be spinning pizzas at. And that brings me joy, even when I, you know, sit down with the staff. If they're having a slow day, we sit, we talk about life. We talk about what's going on in the world. And next thing you know, somebody walks through this door and orders a beer and a pizza and I'm in my happy place. I, it's, I find it to be my escape. I think the future is my retirement will be Red Door mobile pop-up will be my, my future retirement. Sounds perfect to me. Yeah. Let's just cover where you are and when you're there making pizzas at which breweries. Right now, it's been established uh, up until about April. We plan here at Grain and Grit every Saturday you can find us. At Fairweather Brewery, we're on there every Thursday night. Dealtown Cider Co., we're at their place every Tuesday. And they usually have open mic nights, game nights, or open comedy nights. That's where at the moment you'll find the most of my work. Just recently we got approached by Collective Arts. We're working with them right now providing them with their pizzas that they serve people throughout the week when we're not there. We actually have a perfected hard cook fresh topping pizza that freezes beautifully. They are reheating those pizzas and they've asked us can we come on one of the days that we're not at any of the other breweries we're right now in discussion that that could be possibly Friday or Sundays. Just another great place and great vibe. The employees there are awesome. Our pizzas right now are flowing on a weekly basis at their retail tap room. Awesome. I know you can't talk too much about it, but can you just allude to the possibilities of restaurants in Dundas having Red Door Pizza? Yeah, actually there are a couple of places that I honestly think that because I cannot have a dine-in restaurant. Uh, we do do some takeaway with Skip the Dishes and DoorDash. I personally would prefer to not even have the takeaway option. It would be if people want to come find our pizza, they would be at a few other local businesses in Dundas, which I'm just in some discussions right now. And there is nothing solidified, but there are opportunities that are being heard from me right now. Otherwise, yeah, I would prefer that if people want Red Door Pizza, come to a brewery one of the breweries that are local, uh, or hopefully you might find us at a retail uh, section within Dundas at another business. Perfect. Well, I think that's it, Dave. Great. Uh, thank you for sitting down and chatting with me over the last few days and letting me uh, take some footage of you working landscape and tossing pizzas, yeah. and I really appreciate it. Been a pleasure, Travis. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.